the question. Um, I don't know. I think I know and we all know what a science literate citizen in the 20th century constituted. We lived at a time of uh, kind of a competitive pressure with Sputnik, certainly in the West and certainly in the United States. And a lot of how we define being scientifically literate was in terms of um, boosting competitiveness and ensuring that each nation had the um, uh, intellectual resources, the human capital to compete uh, in this sort of new military equation, which was a lot more symmetric at the time. Um, and so we defined scientific literacy in terms of certain concepts, certain ideas, certain sentences we memorized, certain things we learned um, in order to advance. And the way we built science literacy tests, the way we tracked science literacy, the questions we looked at um, had a lot to do with that paradigm. Over the last you know, 30, 40, 50 years, we just celebrated this year, we are celebrating this year, the 50th anniversary of Sputnik. Uh, over the last 50 years, certainly the world has changed, science has changed too, um, and science's place in the world has changed. And so I think that um, the other most significant uh, factor at play to, to sort of define science literacy today is what are the forces acting against science? Um, what are the disruptors um, that could uh, throw off this 21st century scientific renaissance, um, this new science culture. And what is it that's motivating those disruptive forces? Um, and so in order for scientific literacy to be the tool that combats those kinds of disruptive forces, we need to better understand those disruptive forces. And I think we're still at the beginning stages of understanding that. Um, for example, um, science is buttressed by its instability. It's in fact the ability for science to be constantly overturned and constantly proved wrong um, and for theories to only last as good as they are until someone comes along and overturns them that gives it its greatest, one of its greatest sources of stability. But that means living with unknowns and being very comfortable with the unknown and being comfortable with change um, and not being fearful of it um, and politically um, many have been able to successfully uh, leverage that instability on issues like evolution, on issues like climate, um, into incredibly powerful political positions in the world, um, and certainly in the United States. And flip-flopping has become a negative attribute as opposed to one which is one of the highest virtues, um, being able to change one's mind with new evidence. And so really trying to understand what motivates those disruptive forces and expressing to people what science in fact is, um, what the scientific method actually is, why science survives as a tool that we built um, to understand things, to asymptotally veer towards truth, um, is something that will certainly constitute scientific literacy today. I think that uh, the other factor in science literacy today is one of the other factors is certainly um, a transformation from something that is very Western, um, something that we see as, you know, as sort of a Western enterprise, although, you know, the Chinese historically have contributed much to, to the world um, by way of science in, in navigation, in gunpowder and printmaking and so forth. Um, but, you know, for centuries, science has been a largely Western pursuit. And when you look at who wins the Nobel Prizes, it's the Americans. Science is clearly changing, the sort of the landscape of science is changing in the world today. And the emphasis that China is placing on science, I think, um, suggests uh, both the amount of money they're spending on science and also just the emphasis that the leaders in China are now placing on scientific literacy as a cornerstone of economic development in China and of political reform, in fact, um, suggests that we need to start thinking about science um, less as a strictly Western enterprise that's defined by Western values and Western ways of thinking, but becomes a more global um, enterprise. And I think part of that is that my understanding of the way many Chinese people view, the way many American people view science, is as this far more perfunctory technological enterprise than the kind of more um, philosophical and um, slightly more romantic and, and kind of holistic and complete way of looking at problem solving. Um, 
And so it's also about reforming the way we look at science as part of scientific literacy, coming back to that, in the way that Richard Feynman spoke about it, and starting to see things not purely as science is purely a tool to sort of reduce things as a tool for reductionism, but really as a way of achieving an understanding of the most beautiful parts of whatever you're looking at. He said famously that, you know, you could look at a rose and a poet would talk about, you know, some beautiful language about the rose and the painter would talk about the red and someone could talk about the smell and that sounds so much, so much more gratifying and, and satisfying. And then the scientists would come along and give you the biochemical equation for the rose and kind of ruin the whole thing and unweave the rainbow. When in fact, um, if you listen for the next six minutes to the scientist and really allow yourself to go deeper and understand where he or she is going, you understand the, the dance of the molecules that are, allows for all of that to take shape. Um, and you see the inherent aesthetics and poetry and, and beauty of what is at the sort of beneath the surface of all of those other things that artists and humanists will then interpret. So it's about changing our perspective on science that I think is the other pillar of 21st century scientific literacy.